Proverbs is all about living life God's way. And that's what the whole book talks about. And uh, I just love, I mean, he, 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 God is the one that wants, God wants to give us wisdom. All he wants from us is the attitude to seek wisdom. And then he gives us the grace, the desire, the power to do his will. Now, this is where we are looking at our, our, Fourth hour, we're looking at the topic, first of wise, the first hour, that, that life lived God's way. That's what salvation is. That's the people that are trusting him. A servant-hearted person, uh, if you submit, see, Jesus wants us to seek his wisdom and, and uh, allow his grace to work through us. That's what we looked at in hour two. Not ruining our life like Solomon, going the wrong way, his wrong friends and everything, but now... The whole book of Proverbs mentions the topic of pride. And God wants us to be submissive to him and resist pride. And this is is the reason why. Pride is the ultimate sin. Have you ever thought about who Satan is? Satan was the greatest angel. He's the most powerful, the most brilliant, the most amazing creature God ever made. Remember, Satan is a created being. He was, before he fell, Lucifer, the anoint. Now, we're going to study all this next week. Isaiah is all about the fall of Satan. But he fell from being the covering cherub. He's actually called the cherub that covered over the throne of God. What is that? It was like, uh, well, we have a photographer here. They have parabolic flashes. They have these, they look like an umbrella, and there's a light that pops into this reflective surface and it blows out the light. So it's a reflector of light. That's kind of what what Lucifer was. He was like an umbrella causing the glory of God to come back upon God. So all the angels were singing and it's almost like he had his wings out like this over the throne of God. That's what covering cherub is. And guess what he did while he was up there? He started thinking in his mind. You know, it's pretty good to be God. I want to be, didn't say greater than God. He said, I want to be like God. He didn't want to submit to his role. So submission and rebellion and the ultimate sin of pride is what we're going to look at. Proverbs is full of lessons about pride. Uh, Let me just read these, uh, and you can mark them in your notes. Proverbs 8.13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. But pride and arrogance in the evil way, I hate. God hates pride. You want to know what the worst sin is? The worst sin is not becoming a trans or being a homosexual or to have an abortion. You know, the American community makes people think that the ultimate sin is homosexuality or, you know, something like that. Do you know what the ultimate sin is that God hates the most? Pride. Do you know what most people struggle with throughout life? Pride. Do you know what gets people in hell more than drunkenness and immorality? Pride. God hates pride. Secondly, Proverbs 11:2, when pride comes, then comes shame. But with the humble is wisdom. See, God, remember what Peter said, resists the proud. God, if he sees pride in our life, he starts resisting our life. Do you want to have a hard time? Have God resisting your life. God, see, the thing about God is he's in the box with you. He's the ultimate person to either help us or resist us. And and we need to submit to him. Proverbs 13.10 says this, when pride comes, by pride comes nothing but strife. You ever find a person doesn't get along with anyone? There's pride involved because it brings strife. But with the well-advised is wisdom. Proverbs 14.3, in the mouth of the fool is the rod of pride, but the lips of the wise preserve them. And that that says that a proud person, their words are like hitting people. Uh, Proverbs 16.18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Wow. I mean... I don't know if you know much about American news, but the the huge corporation, the $47 billion corporation called WeWork, went bankrupt yesterday. It's one of the most spectacular corporate falls in American history. 
And you know what the founder of WeWork was known for? Uh, not humility. And, and everyone says it's the most amazing thing. He had the best idea of his company, and it got to $47 billion, and he was unwilling to take anybody's advice, and he crashed to bankruptcy. That's what the Bible says. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction. Proverbs 21, 24, a proud and haughty man, a scoffer is his name. He acts with arrogant pride. Proverbs 29, 23, a man's pride will bring him low. So God says, you want to you wanna have me resist you? Don't humble yourself. So what is God's will for our character? God wants to make me humble. And, and let's just talk about what Proverbs says. And these, there uh, should be a page for all these in your notes. I call these the, these the manifestations of pride. Here's the first one. Proverbs 11.2 puts it this way. When pride comes, then comes shame. And these manifestations of pride is that we become deceitful by covering up our sins. Uh, do, you remember, do, do you remember when King Saul was confronted by the prophet Samuel and, and Samuel said to Saul, why didn't you obey the Lord? And he said, I did obey the Lord. And as he said that in the background, you could hear this, a cow. And, and Samuel said, what is the, the animal sound I'm hearing? And King Saul said, the people, the people made me keep the animals. See, he covered up his own sin, covered up his, his failure to obey God by blaming it on someone else. A manifestation of pride is we become deceitful. We cover up our sins, our faults, and mistakes. Number two, it, it says in Proverbs 18, 1 and 2, um, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against wise judgment. A fool has no delight in understanding but in expressing his own heart. When someone excludes others from involvement in their life, it's a sign of pride. They don't need help. Remember I told you about my small group and all those men? Did you know they, they initially did not want to get together? Why? Because they didn't want to share their struggles. They didn't want to share their needs. They didn't want to share their weaknesses. And it was a form of pride. And their leader, the man that I told you about that came to me in Starbucks and said, I want to do this, he prevailed. And he looked at, I couldn't do it. He looked at each guy in our Bible study and he said, you will do he was the, the leader. He'd probably been together with him since high school. He said, you will do your Bible study, you will write that prayer, and you will read it out loud. And all the other guys went. And he was like the team captain. And our first time they did it was a week later. We sat at Panera, and the first guy said, I'll be first. And he got out his journal, and he, we were studying Genesis, and he said, Lord, I not, I'm not treating my wife the way I should help me to. Lord, I'm thinking more about my business than I think about you. And he went right down the line. That broke the dam. And from then on, every one of the men were open to having a close relationship. Now, do you all know this verse, Hebrews 10, 24, and 25? You've all heard it. You should have it underlined. It says, not forsaking the gathering together of yourselves, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What that says is that the purpose of the gathering of God's people is for us to exhort one another. Do, do you know what the Greek word for exhort is? I already did my Greek over here. I'll tell you about this one. It's, it's a word that is fascinating. It says, stir up one another, actually, is the English, stir up. But the Greek word is uh, paroxysm. Let's see, paroxys, I don't know what the ending is. I've forgotten Greek. Uh, but paroxysm is an English word that means for something to, to kind of explode, to have a paroxysm is kind of like to have a convulsion. We're supposed to 
not allow people to stay like they are. Um, this, is, this is what I used to do. I was a youth pastor for five years. I had those hundred boys in my youth group. And I made them a deal. I said this. Every time I see you throughout the week, we all lived uh, on campus, a 200-acre campus. It was a Christian school, and they were dorm students. And I said, when I see you, I'm going to walk up to you. Say, Sophie, where, where, where did you read in the Bible last? Mm -hmm. And what did you learn? Good. And are you working on your memory verse? Do you want to share a little bit with me? I said, that's what I'm going to do every time I see you. And so I'd be walking across the 200-acre campus. And I'd see one of them. And I would start walking down the sidewalk toward them. And all of a sudden, they would turn and go this way on one of the sidewalks. Why do you think they did that? They hadn't read the Bible yet. They didn't have anything to say. So I would just go through life, you know, between classes and everything. And a few hours later, I would see that same person coming down the sidewalk. And they would be walking right toward me. They'd walk right up. And I'd say, hi. And they'd stand there. I said, hi. And they'd stand there. And then they'd say, aren't you going to what? Ask me. What did they do between the first time I saw them and then? They went home and got in the Bible and they were ready. Why did they do that? Because I stirred them up. See, that's what you can do. You want to know how to transform any gathering of saints and churches? Go up, and when you're in church the next time, walk up to someone and say, what is the Lord teaching you in the Word of God these days? And remember what they say, and the next time you see them, ask them again. And you know what most people do? They say the same thing every time. They just have an answer, but they're not really in the Word of God. And what I, I used to write in the back of my Bible, I had this little sheet of paper in the back of my Bible, and uh, I still have it there. Uh, from when I was pastoring, and the last thing that people told me, I would keep adding, and I would type, my secretary would type it out, and I'd paste it in my Bible, and I'd see him again, and I'd go like this. I'd say, that's what you said last time. And they went, because they weren't growing. God wants us to grow. Pride keeps us from growing. Okay, number three, a lack of admitting when you're wrong. Proverbs 10, 17 puts this, he who keeps instruction is the way of life, but he who refuses correction goes astray. It's a sign of pride to refuse correction. Here's another one, talking too much. Uh, the, in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. Another sign of pride is talking about yourself. Have you ever met someone that they are the hero of every story they tell, and, and other people are talking, and they're almost like here, waiting to jump in and say, I did that, I did that, I did that. What is that? They, they just are self-focused. Being devastated or angered by criticism. Proverbs 13, 1, a wise son heeds his father's instruction, but a scoffer won't listen to rebuke. Another one, being unteachable. Someone who, who will not receive instruction. It says in Proverbs 19, 20, that listen to counsel, receive instruction, that you may be wise in your latter days. Unteachableness is pride. Being, how about this, sarcastic, hurtful, degrading. Proverbs 12, 18 says this. There is one who speaks like the piercing of a sword. Have you ever been around someone like that? They can say, you can come up to them and they'll say something about your shoes or about your hair or about your, you know, whatever. And it's just like, <laughs> did you know that is a sign of pride? They... By, by, by the way, you know what sarcastic means? It's like hooks. The, the, the idea of sarks, it's a hook in, you know, like, like something that, like barbed wire that gets into your skin. They give words that like cut into you and cling to you, and they want to hurt you. And that's the sign of pride. Again, Proverbs talks about blame shifting in Proverbs 12.1. Uh, he who hates correction is stupid. Uh, they, they, they are defensive. They, they push away the, the uh, correction. Number 10, not asking forgiveness. Proverbs 28, 13. He who covers his sin 
will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes will have mercy. Uh, resisting authority, Proverbs 30, 17. The eye that mocks his father and scorns obedience to his mother, the ravens of the valley will pick out his eyes, and the young will eat of it. Wow. Well, here's a summary. Pride makes me resentful from when corrected. If, if someone corrects you and says, you shouldn't have done that, and you get resentful, that is an unbiblical uh, attitude. It's pride. Hurt when disappointed. Impatient when hindered. Greedy when choosing. Have, do you know what's cute about children? Children, if you put a plate of cookies in front of them, a little child will look at all the cookies and pick the what for themselves? The biggest and best one. We, and we chuckle about that. We think that's cute. But you know what that is? That's pride. Thinking, I, the Bible says that, that we are sinners from the womb. And so when we are greedy, when we choose things, uh, do you remember Lot with Abraham in the promised land? Their, their flocks got too big. So Abraham, Uncle Abraham, stood with nephew Lot and, and stood on a mountain, and they said, here's the whole, all of the land. And Abraham said to Lot, you pick first where you want to put your herds, and I'll take what's left. And so you know what the Bible says? Lot went like this. And it says, behold, this whole side was lush green like a golf course and well watered. And over here was not. And Lot said, I'll take this part. And guess what was right in the middle of his golf course? A city called what? Do you remember where he moved? Sodom. And do you remember what happened to Lot? He lost his wife. God turned her into a pillar of salt. He lost all of his children but two. Most people don't realize Lot had other children in Sodom that burned up because it said his sons-in-law thought he was crazy and they wouldn't come with him. The only ones that escaped were Lot, Mrs. Lot, and two daughters. So their unmarried daughters went with them. Their married kids stayed in Sodom and got burned up. So Lot lost his wife, his family, and he even lost his own reputation. He got involved in sordid immorality with his own daughters. Why? Well, you know when it started? I want the best for me. Pride makes me greedy, critical when speaking of rivals. You ever meet someone that they always say, oh, you know, something bad about someone that's better than them? Jealous. They don't want other people to advance. They want themselves. Untruthful and distant when slighted. Those are all manifestations of pride. Okay, pride was the first sin. We're going to cover that next week in Isaiah 14. Lucifer challenged God. Pride is the ultimate sin. And anytime there's a conflict, a fight, or trouble, somewhere in the background is pride. Here's the, the key text. Isaiah 14. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, and look, this, this, is, what, this is what Satan, this is how Lucifer became Satan. You notice the repeated... I, I bolded them and highlighted and underlined them. This is the, the way that we see pride. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the furthest sides of the north. I will ascend into the heights of the clouds. And look at this. I will be like the Most High. I consider that phrase in verse 14 to be one of the most powerful examples of inspiration. Do you know what inspiration says? God wrote those words. He recorded those words for us. He recorded what Satan said through Isaiah. But if someone other than God was writing the Bible, kind of like a Marvel action movie, what would Satan have said? I will be greater, or I'm going to take God's place. Do you know what Satan knew? He knew he was a created being and that you couldn't. He could never be greater than God because he knew God made him. See, Satan at least is honest. 
he is a liar, but he knows reality. He didn't say, I will be greater than the Most High God. He just said, I want to be equal with him. And that's the essence of pride. Wanting to take a position we never could take, and yet we still want it. Yet, God says, you'll be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. So that was Satan's problem. What, what is the problem? It's the my way problem. Isaiah put it this way. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned what? Everyone to yeah, his own way. Uh, Frank Sinatra, if you ever heard of the American singer, he has a famous song, I Did It My Way. That was an ancient loved song. Did you know that's the song of the proud? Now, real quickly, look at James 4 with me, because James talks about how we solve this. And before we finish, is this class over at 50? Oh, oh, no, I have too many slides. I'm going to go really fast. James chapter 4. Here we go, because I want to catch up. It says, uh, where do wars and fights come from, verse 1? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. You ask and don't receive because you ask amiss that you may consume it on your pleasures. So how do we cure that? Well, first of all, God is warning in these first verses that pride will rot us if we allow it to seep through. Did you know that wood, if water gets on it and bugs, rots? Do you guys know that around here? That these wooden cabins are slowly falling apart? Why? Because water gets in them and everything. That's why, you know, you've got the, the tarp on the back side of that because the storm was putting in water. If we allow pride to seep into our life, look what it does. James 4.1 says, where do fights come from? Pride poisons my relationships. It pollutes my life, the end of verse. They war in my life. It produces anxiety, verse 2. Uh, you, you have all this stuff and you, you can't, you, you're anxious because you don't get what you want. It ruins your prayers. It, look at verse 4. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? God becomes opposed to us. We can't grow spiritually. So pride is horrible. But what happens when we resist pride. And that starts in, in verse 6. But he gives more grace. Look at this. God says, I'm offering you wisdom. If you seek it, God gives grace to empower us. Look what verse 6 says of James 4. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud. He's in your box. And he will not allow us, if we belong to him, if we've trusted Christ, to remain proud so what does he ask us to do? Accept his grace to humble ourselves. Here's what humility does. Humility prompts a dose of grace. This morning, we're staying in the speakers. We finally moved in. You know, we, we were off campus, and last night we got into our room. And, and this morning, I reached in behind the shower curtain, and I turned on that knob of the shower, and immediately the coldest blast of water you've ever felt came right from, I think, the Pacific Ocean. It was so cold. Hit me. Guess what? Humility prompts a shower of grace. Think about that. Do you want to get showered with grace? Humble yourself. Humility provides deliverance from God. Look at verse 7. Submit to God, resist the devil, he'll flee from you. When we submit to God, the opposite, the opposite of pride is submission. God delivers us from the devil. Verse 8, draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. Humility gets us close to God. Verse 8 continues, cleanse your hand. Humility promotes cleansing and God making us succeed. Now look at this. Humility takes the attraction away from sports. You know, a lot of people uh, love sports because, you know, they can be the expert of that. The captivation away from finances. People love to show off their finances. The fascination away from media. As God's grace makes the world offensive to me 
and God becomes more important than my entertainment and pursuits. The only medication that defeats pride is grace, right here. God offers, we say yes, he gives us grace, we submit. The only pathway to grace is submission. And grace allows us to clothe ourselves. Look at Colossians now, back up from James to Paul's epistle to the Colossians. By the way, I love how the Bible's all connected. And Colossians 3 tells us, oh, good, we still have time. Look at Colossians 3.12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, anybody in verse 12, what's the next two words? I see some. Just before that. But, but before, start at the beginning of the verse and read it. Let's see how yours reads. Therefore, yeah. Oh, there it is. The first two words then. Do you understand what humility, how you get it? Some people just say, I want to be humble. You know what God says? That you do what I did this morning. Do you all see my blue shirt? You should have seen it last night. It was crumpled up. You know, we've been traveling since August, and it was crumpled up and stuffed in. And I heard the sound of... Bonnie got out the ironing board, and then I heard f -f 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 the iron started, you know, how it puffs steam. And I heard these sounds, and she completely made my shirt all flat again instead of crumpled. And it hung on a hanger. And this morning, how do you think I got it on? I didn't stand there like the Iron Man, you know, and wait for it to fly at me. I went over and grabbed it and put it on. Do you know what the Bible says? God enables, or his grace enables us to clothe ourselves with humility. We say, enough's enough. I want you. I want to submit to you. I want your humility in my life. Jesus models this. Did you know what Jesus says? For, or all the way through, but here are three examples. Jesus said, I don't want to do my own will. Have you ever noticed how many times he said that? I don't want my own will. I don't want my own will. I want the will of my Father. What was Jesus doing? Clothing himself with humility. The conclusion is, clothe yourself with humility. John 3.30, do you remember how, how John the Baptist put it? He must increase, but I must decrease. That should be our goal in life. I want Christ to increase. I want to act more like him, look more like him. And the way I do it, is to clothe myself with humility and submit to God. Can you believe we caught up? You guys are so good, you listened fast. Take a break and I'll go back to normal speed next hour.